Welcome to Citizens Forum. Um, I, I'll be the host for this first segment. My name is Walt McGinnis, and I have with me today uh, Ted Smith. And Ted is the uh, president and founder of the Victoria Can Cannabis Buyers Club. And uh, there's lots of discussion right now going on about what's going to happen in Canada with the use of cannabis now that the government's going to legalize it. So welcome to the show, Ted. Thank you very much, Walt. It's nice to be here. So look, Ted, the government's going to legalize cannabis and uh, you know they're going to license all these new growers and uh, isn't this just a good thing for Canada? Well I guess it's it's kind of good bad and ugly you know there's certainly many good things about legalization and the stigma that will disappear from yeah. people being you know branded as, as criminals uh, is wonderful to experience you know we've been stigmatized for a very long time and so to have cannabis normalized is an absolutely wonderful thing and when you include all the benefits from hemp and the industrial products we can make from that uh, we're, we're talking some massive economic health and environmental benefits that will come from legalization and yeah. that should be applauded um, however there are many bad components to this um, certainly what's happening to the cannabis industry and how it's being taken over by corporations uh, is is not a good thing they should be legalizing that but the ugly is what's happening yeah. to patients and they're gonna if they follow through on all their plans people will literally die prematurely and suffer as a result of legalization so it's okay let's touch on a couple of things firstly I mean with these corporations now that are going to be growing the, the cannabis and you see these pictures in the media and this massive massive uh, mm -hmm. production scale type of facilities um, do you think that uh, the, the, there's going to be a quality control going on in those facilities that has been going on in these smaller operations? Um, oh, there'll be massive amounts of quality control to the point where I understand the government is going to have a cap of 15% THC on the cannabis that's sold. And so uh, it's in a way hyper-regulated, yeah. which uh, you know will mean for a, a good consistent cannabis, but they're not legalizing cannabis because we had bad herb and people were getting sick from it. Yeah. You know, Sure, we, we should be using less pesticides as an industry, because some people do, and better fertilizers, but there hasn't been you know, real negative health consequences as a result of that. Yeah. And so there will be improved quality assurance, um, to be sure, but that quality assurance could be done by smaller growers who have no chance to participate in this system that these corporations yeah. will be the producers of. And okay, so, so how about the issue around uh, people that are using cannabis for health reasons? Hmm. How are they going to be affected with the, this new regime? Well, there's certainly no benefit to them. In fact, there's going to be a new tax that they're all going to have to pay, uh, the sin tax that's going to be added to it. And such that uh, the, the real problem, especially for dispensaries like ours, we've been in existence for 22 years, providing cannabis cookies and salves and different capsules with oils and such. Um, if we were to comply with these new regulations, we would be forced to take off the vast majority of our products. Uh, cookies and edibles will not be legally available under this new system. Um, and it, it, it won't be for a year. And so for okay. dispensaries that are already in existence, this is a, a huge step back and they want to shut us all down. And uh, it's been very threatening what they plan on doing to us. So the edibles uh, will not be legalized with uh, in this first first legalization? No, edibles, hash, uh, uh, concentrates uh, of any type that will allow for very weak kind of vegetable oil yeah. type products to be sold. Um, but no, they, they won't allow, you know, a cannabis brownie yeah. uh, or, a, you know, a cookie or, or anything like that to be sold. You know, I, there's a product that was, I think it's called cannabis oil. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But uh, I've seen online where many people have used that for fighting cancer with hmm. great results. Definitely. Is that a product that, that will be, will that be, be sold now um, or will this be changed? Th they'll, they'll be able to sell them, the, these large corporations, but with very low concentrations of the active ingredients like THC. Yeah. So they'll be very weak compared to the higher concentrations that we sell. Yeah. And so the effectiveness will be much less for people. Okay. And so, uh, um, and there's no real significant benefit for patients at all. And like I say, you know, shutting down uh, the dispensaries that have existed until now supplying these medical needs 
uh, is, yeah. is abhorrent, but the provincial government intends on doing that. The Cannabis Control Board will be hiring inspectors, much like liquor inspectors, yeah. that can walk into a dispensary without a warrant, seize all the products, and then they'll find the organization double what they estimate the value of those to be. So how, what's the story? Well, is, are they going to be saying you'll have to be licensed and we're not going to grant you a license? Is that how it's going to go? They are saying that if, if you don't have a license from the provincial government and, yeah. and if you not, aren't buying their products, because they're going to have complete control. They're going to have a big warehouse. All right. So all these licensed producers will sell to the province. The province is going to prepackage it yeah. and sell it to the retailers. And if you're not buying their product and paying them a license to sell it, then they're going to come and shut you down using these inspectors. They want to eliminate the competition and they consider dispensaries like ours to be organized crime that's been profiting that they want to shut down. Well, that's remarkable. I hadn't thought of that because now it's, it's a pretty good racket for them because they're going to control the supply and then everybody else is just going to be uh, retailers paying taxes and, and doing all the things that they want and they can pretty well force you into uh, a situation of how much you can charge for the product and everything. Yep. Okay, so I can see where there's a problem there. Now, how would you look at, you know, like, um, I know there's some towns in British Columbia like Nelson and Merritt where there's a pretty good industry, been going there for quite a, lot, quite a few years. Uh, and uh, these local growers, of course, uh, are small businessmen and uh, they're spending probably every cent they're making right in those communities. Um, how do you think the economies are going to be affected in those, those small towns that have been relying on that industry so long? Well, we can use the Cowichan Valley as an example here because there's a lot of people that are growing cannabis yeah. there that have been essentially using their medical licenses to sell the excess to on the, yeah. the sort of the green market, if you were. Um, and, uh, you know, that's where dispensaries have been getting the bulk of their supply. Yeah. And uh, honestly, um, it's, it's kind of <laughs> proliferated. Yeah. And so there's a, a glut on the market right now because so many people are desperately trying to, to grow this herb and, and make yeah. money off of it. And so the price is already going down. Yeah. And uh, it's something that if the government intended upon competing with that, you would think that they would be projecting you know, lower prices to the consumer. But with yeah. all the taxes and things that they want to put on it, the prices in these new retail stores that are going to be you know, government run or, or, or yeah. sanctioned, is going to be so high that the black market is still going to flourish. Well, and this so is that, interesting. there will be an effect, uh, to be sure, on some of these yeah. economies that are really heavily dependent on it. But uh, certainly in British Columbia, the vast majority of people aren't going to be going to these stores and buying it with the yeah. limits on THC, the excessive costs, and, and other limitations on it. You know, most people are going to be very happy that it's legal, but they're not going to go buy it in, in, <laughs> you know, from these other places if they can you know, pretty much feel safe about buying it from their friends that they've always been buying it from. Uh, in Ontario, it's different. Ontario, you'll see the majority of people will want to go to the stores and yeah. not associate with, you know, the, the organized crime yeah. in any sense. So, um, but uh, certainly uh, it will have an impact negatively on, uh, you know, these communities that are relying on small growers because a lot of them are getting squeezed out of the market now. Now, here's an idea for you. Uh, you know, because all together, if you think about all the small growers in, in this province, has, uh, has, have the growers ever considered get, forming an association or a co-op or something like that to try to compete with these larger operations? Oh, there's a, a lot of that going on. Yeah. Um, different, you know, associations and, and types yeah. of conglomerates going on. Um, but uh, it's, it's not going to stop this new regime from coming in yeah and uh they're going to go after all these dispensaries that are operating you know uh you know technically illegally yeah uh, even those that have operated for decades they're they're wanting to shut it all down so that they can control it um yeah so uh you know the the growers don't don't stand much of a chance even if they work together the legislation's in it's coming really? down there's not at this point yeah. it's too late in the game to do anything like this is yeah happening. we what i see i see some very very large corporations uh all across the country you know uh opening up these operations it's been much like the tobacco industry i think oh where, 
it, it's, it's out of control. Like in the first 10 days of this year, $10 billion was invested into licensed producers in Canada to grow cannabis. Wow. So there's this whole stock market game, right, where this money flows yeah. around, right? So all of a sudden they think there's this capital gain that they can all seek if they get on the ground early. And so they're building massive grow ops, far more than the demand is in this country. Yeah. And they're selling it now to their investors that they'll be able to sell it to other countries that aren't growing their own yet. Okay. Australia and Germany and all these other places. When in fact Canada is one of the worst countries in the world to grow cannabis in. You know, the climate it's is not suited. Like it should be getting grown in Mexico where they don't need to have a greenhouse and fans. Yeah. You just grow it outside and it does really well. Yeah. So, you know, w eventually, you know, all these companies are going to go bankrupt because they're putting investments into things that are unsustainable. But there's this cash cow that everybody thinks that they got to get in first and make more. And because there's no limitations or anything like that being put on the government, they're just issuing licenses and people are... Like Aurora, one company alone, is growing enough to supply one-third of the Canadian market. Oh my like gosh. the consumption levels right now. That's just one of these big companies. Yeah. And so they're just frothing at the mouth at the idea they're going to make money, but they're all going to suffer for it. Many of yeah. them will go bankrupt. They'll be buying each other. They're already buying each other up. Yeah. But it's at inflated prices. And you know, at a certain point here, uh, re reality will kick in, and, and there'll be even more adjustments. These companies are hyper-evaluated. But that's Dad, the way stock markets work, right? Is there the provincial government can do? I know it's mostly federally regulated, but is there, are there things that provincial government could do to protect small growers and things oh, of that nature? Oh, uh, not so much growers. Unfortunately, the feds are controlling the supply end. So yeah. they're the ones that have put the, the noose on growers. And at some point, they intend on having a second tier where smaller growers will get in. But yeah. that's being co-opted by the larger companies that are yeah. sponsoring the smaller ones. And it's... Anyway... Um, the province has a lot of control on the retail end. And actually the municipalities have even more control. Yeah. Um, if you look at uh, the responsibilities laid out, the, the municipalities have about twice as much responsibility as the other two levels of government, including yeah. enforcement, uh, which is one reason I'm actually running for city council is to try to have some real sense put into these yeah. laws as they come into place. Because um, for example, uh, the province of BC has decided that they won't allow smoking lounges anywhere. It's like we have a, a lounge in our club. Our members yeah. depend on it in many cases. And that's another thing that's threatened is they our whole community. They won't allow smoking lounges when, anywhere in the province. Yeah, right. It's being banned in many cities like Victoria, just like tobacco, where you can't smoke it in parks or anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get kicked out of your home if you smoke it there, unless you own your own home. Yeah. Just like the growing, you're allowed to grow four plants, but if you live in a rental or in a condo, you're not likely going to be able to do that without, you know, and so the only ones that can grow the four plants per household are going to be homeowners. Yeah. Which are likely able to afford to buy their own anyway. Yeah. But uh, it's uh, something that, uh, yeah, there's just so many different things. Like, for example, uh, it'll now be illegal to be intoxicated from cannabis in public. Just like, you know, being drunk in public, if a police officer comes up to you and decides that you're intoxicated, they can give you a fine. They can throw you in jail because you just smoked a joint now. Is that a new that's law? That's new law with legalization, yeah. And that's a federal law? I think that's federal, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, I, it's, I find it, um, of course, I'm naturally skeptical about these developments because, you know, when the big government gets involved and big business gets involved, it's usually the citizens that pay the price one way or another and we lose services or we just lose conveniences that we had before and we lose freedoms as you say with these laws and uh, somebody is laughing all the way to the bank with the new setup. Anyway they're giving us a wrap-up signal Ted and it's been so interesting to talk to you and I hope we, we can have you back and over, over a few months as we things start to evolve here and, and the and the new regime is getting into place, it'd be good to get reports from you as to how it's really affecting the local people here in Victoria. Well, it is a fascinating time to be in this industry. I'll it give sure you is. <laughs> Thank you for Thank having you me so on much, the show. Ted. It's a pleasure. So that completes uh, this segment of Citizens Forum. Hello, uh, welcome back. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every two weeks. It's the Walt and Jack Show, and it is Wednesday, June the 20th. So, Walt, what have you got? Well, last, last week, Jack, I, I was talking about uh, the, all the events around the approval of Champix, which is a smoking cessation drug 
that uh, the Christie Clark Liberals uh, uh, approved back in 2011 and a lot of things transpired since then uh, and there's a lot of really big questions hanging out still around what happened around the approval of this drug when it's uh, been shown worldwide to be very dangerous and uh, uh, hundreds of suicides have been associated with, uh, with the use of this drug. So what I did was I, I, I wrote an article and uh, it's going to be published on uh, powertothepeople.ca and uh, it just goes over the history of this event and there's so many things that ha are go still go unanswered and probably the biggest thing is uh, when uh, Adrian Dix was a health critic he uh, really was firm on saying we have to have an inquiry into what happened here and uh, now that he is the Minister of Health, there's not been a word about any sort of inquiry. And, and we should say that that's not a surprise. That's the way they all play the game. Well, they this pretend, is it. And and then they they break their pretense. But uh, the public does deserve answers to some oh, of these absolutely. questions. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, it really does look like the Liberals uh, went right ahead and approved a drug that's quite dangerous to use because of. Uh, political influence on their party. So and the NDP promised an investigation and then now does nothing. Nothing's happening. So uh, this story is not going to go away and then there's, uh, there's other ingredients to it. Uh, the mysterious death of Rod McIsaac and the one of the researchers. Uh, there's some circumstances around his death that have not, in my mind, uh, laid to rest issues around uh, foul play. Uh, and uh, it seems that the corporate media hasn't picked up on that issue, but if you look at what the coroner said and, and the process, uh, it took seven months to declare that because he had committed suicide. I think that warrants further investigation of why did it take the coroner that long to come to that ruling. And the underlying story here is what power does the multinational pharmaceutical industry have over the government of BC? Is there any link between protecting the pharmaceutical industry and all of the craziness that happened? Because the whole story they told us was essentially a pack of lies. Yeah. The official story in the media never really delved into what everybody knows is the truth. Like, and the truth is, you know, what caused them to do these, all these crazy things? Ca create this investigation, basically lie about what because nobody yeah. did anything. There was no reason, but they did it. Yeah, anyway, I've, I've sketched it out. You can read it on the, my website for what it's worth. And uh, hopefully uh, people will keep asking questions about this issue and, and try to get the government to do something about it. Well, today, was it today or was it yesterday? Today's the 20th, so it was kind of yesterday in a massive betrayal of the people of British Columbia and the salmon and really the people of the whole planet, the NDP government uh, seemingly has decided uh, not to get rid of the 20 fish farms whose licenses were up for renewal today. And it's been interesting to watch the government and the media work together to make sure the public remained virtually unaware of, of uh, the truth of what they're doing and, and that, I think, is a real problem we face. Both the government and the media work for the corporation, are owned by the corporation. And the corporation has interests. One of them, obviously, is fish farms. So the media, I mean, this, is, this decision to get rid of these 20 fish farms whose licenses were up for renewal today, it's a massive issue for British Columbia. It's a tremendous, but there hasn't been anything in the media for the last month. Right, so nobody is aware. Nobody. Yeah, is. you know, and Lana Popham was just on CBC as I was coming in, uh, talking about the decision. And there was two conditions. One was that the the salmon farmers have to meet the conditions set out by the federal fisher Department of Fisheries, the Canadian Federal. Can I government. roll my eyes while you're saying that? You, you're allowed yeah, to, yeah. given that they their history of ignoring the scientific evidence that. Farm salmon are killing wild salmon. That you, you just have to understand that farming in in the open open pens, uh, you know, uh, 
poisons. transmits so yeah. many diseases that all the migrating salmon going past are declining. That's happened worldwide. That's the science. It's just, the only people that don't seem to understand that is the Canadian federal fisheries. So having to meet and their the, conditions. And the BCNDP. It's is like, is, you know, you have to wonder what are they talking about. The other thing is, is that, uh, that basically they have to work in, in consultation with the, with the First Nations people in the future, in the five years or six years ahead in the future. Can I roll when, my eyes again? Uh, well, two or three governments, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's uh, 2022, so we can have two or three So here we are in 2018. The licenses are up renewal. They could have canceled them now. Instead, they renew yeah. them, I think, for four years and say that at the end of that four years, they're going to have to get approval from the First yeah. Nations. Yeah, right. Like, you're not going to be there in four years. And you'll roll, whoever is, will just roll it through just like you rolled this through. Why should anybody believe anything that Lana Potham or John Horgan or the NDP are saying? I mean, why should we believe anything they say? Well, they're trotting out that old horse that, that you know, this is good for our economy, good for economic. But it's not. This is bad it. for the economy. Wild uh, farm salmon are killing farm salmon. How could that be good for the economy? Yeah, yeah. This is what First Nations people have been saying for the last 15 or 20 years. What is it they don't understand? So this seems a bit disingenuous, the whole thing, as far as I'm concerned. Put it, anyways, as I said, a massive betrayal of the people of British Columbia. I mean, John Horgan and the NDP should, uh, should be removed from office for this kind of... Uh, this Because... I mean, if this is what the people of British Columbia want, if the people of British Columbia want these licenses renewed for the next four years, then hey, okay, we have to do it. But the people of British Columbia don't want this, so who is John Horgan working for? Why is he doing this? And if he's not doing it for us, then he should be removed from office as a dictatorial imitator of what a, the premier of a province in a democratic country is supposed to be. It's, it's completely absurd, and, and, and you know, yeah. the media has downplayed it, downplayed it as much as they could, and again, you see the two working together to screw us, basically. The corporate media, when I say the media. Have we got another topic? What else do you have, Jack? That's all I had. <sighs> this, uh, this is the Oak Bay News for today, Wednesday, June the 20th. And there's a full page ad. It's called, Is David Eby Trying to Manipulate You? This is in the Oak Bay News. It's, it's in several of the local newspapers today. It's been on the front page of the, uh, the whole front page of the Vancouver province and the whole front page of the Vancouver Sun. So somebody with a lot of money is obviously spending it because this is about proportional voting. And what this guy is saying, whoever put this ad in, guy or gal, is he saying, is David Eby trying to manipulate you? And they're saying, the question here at the bottom, the question right there at the bottom, you can't read it, but I'm gonna read it for you. It says, why hasn't David Eby recommended a ballot with one simple question? Right, like this is too difficult. There's two parts to the, to the, to the question we are going to be asked. Part one says, do you want to keep first past the post or do you want to move to a second to a proportional voting system? Uh, what could be simpler than that? So if, <laughs> if more than half the people say we want to move to proportional voting, then the second part is counted and yeah. there's three choices and you choose one, two, three, and the one that gets the most in the end wins. I mean, it couldn't much be, be much more simpler than that. But this person, whoever it is, and, or, or group, is running full page ads saying, why hasn't David Eby recommended a ballot with one simple question? So it just shows us the, the tremendous power that is arrayed, and money, against proportional representation. And when you see that kind of power and money arrayed against something, then you know that you might think that that something is a very, very good thing. Because proportional voting is more democratic, and that is what these people do not want, more democracy. Because right now they run the whole show. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see, I don't know what they're talking about. You look at it. They are asking one simple question. What else do you have to know? Oh, by the way, if you'd like to consider proportional representation, they're asking you what, what brand would you prefer? I mean. 
this is a pretty simple ballad. I, I'm pretty happy with it. It's not the one I would have chosen. I, I had something else in mind, but I'm fine with this one. Yeah. 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 Moving on. Oh. I tried to get into the press gallery today. I don't know if you got my email. This is, this is a kind of interesting story. We've been trying for years to get into the press gallery. We've contacted them, and we've always been kind of pushed away. I think, can I say that? Is oh, that, I would say that's fair, yeah. yeah. And so today there was a press conference about, uh, it was going to be Lana Popham standing up for, you know, for uh, this idea of her, what she's done with, with, with the uh, fish farms. So I wanted to go to the press conference. I got sent to, I phoned the NDP yesterday. I got sent, a, not an invitation, but an uh, announcement. So it's in the press gallery, in the legislature. So I wanted to go. They won't let me in. They won't let us in because we are not the corporate media. If you're not the corporate media, you can't get in and into the press gallery. You can't ask the question of Lana, which I'm sure nobody else asked. Isn't this a total betrayal of everything you were elected to do? I'm sure none of the corporate media asked that question. But I was going to ask that question, but they, they won't let me in. So we'll see uh, the, the new head has said uh, there's a process and uh, we'll see if we can meet the process. That's great, Jack. You know, I, I did talk to Tom Fletcher, who's the president of the Press Gallery, a few months ago uh, when we were trying to get in uh, the legislature on another issue, and he said that they had really tightened up their security since the attempted bombing in 2012 of the legislature. And I replied to him, I said, well, you know, there is reasons to limit how close the RCMP should get to the legislative lawns, given the evidence that the judge said that the cops had set this crime up. Uh, but Tom Fletcher didn't seem to have heard about that. And, and it seems almost ironic that they're basing that completely fabricated story in the corporate media, a completely to keep us uh, out. A myth that, that existed that there's these two people tried to bomb the legislative lawns when the cops manufactured that crime. Now, I'm using the language that the judge is using in the ruling. I'm sorry, this is just the way it is. So uh, to, for them to use that as a reason to keep us out, it, you know, <laughs> there's a little bit of irony involved there. To me, it, it's kind of an issue of freedom of the press. I mean, we've been on doing this show for, for five years on Channel 4, our community TV station. You know, we're broadcast like eight or ten times a week. We are the media. We are the local media. Yeah. So why can't we get into the legislature to, to, to do what the rest of the media does? And the, and the barrier is, it is the media. They are the ones who are keeping us out. Because if you don't have the okay from the press gallery, yeah. you can't get in. So, so they are the, the media itself are the ones who are keeping the independent media out, which is, of course, exactly what you'd expect. I'm going to just finish off, I think we've got about one minute left, by saying I think things could be so, 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 so much better in our towns, in our cities, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our jobs, and in many other places as well, if we could just toss off this corporate monster that rules over us and all the wealth they take and all the trouble they make and just get rid of them and replace them with a more democratic government. And I just got the wrap-up sign, so, well, thank you very much. On that note, it's and a good idea, Jack. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Bank. Welcome back. It's uh, the third segment. It's Wednesday, June the 20th. I'd like to thank again the volunteer crew and Shaw staff that makes this program happen. Uh, our guest in this segment is Sarah Cox, um, who's written a book called Breaching the Peace, talking about the Peace River Valley and the Sight Sea Dam. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Jack. Um, can you tell us about the Peace River Valley? Sure. So um, the Peace River Valley is in northeast uh, BC. Uh, many people know about it because you turn on your radio in the morning and hear about the weather and the peace, but we don't often hear much more than that about the peace uh, in, 
on Vancouver Island or um, in Vancouver. And it's largely out of sight and out of mind. Um, but it, it really shouldn't be because uh, there is a large hydro project under construction there that will affect each and every British Columbian in terms of its absolutely astronomical cost as well as its severe impact on the environment, on First Nations treaty rights and on the farming community in the valley. Yeah, so it's kind of been, let's talk a little bit about the costs because I mean, to me, the numbers were always faked from the very beginning by BC Hydro. But what is this going to cost us? So uh, Site C would be the third dam on the Peace River, and it would flood uh, an area of the Peace River Valley that's largely intact. And I'll just take a little bit of a step back and, and describe a bit of the valley. So on, if you, as you come into the valley, on one side of the valley, it's largely a farming and ranching community. On the other side of the valley, which is a very broad valley, it's five or six kilometers wide in places, there's a beautiful um, old growth boreal forest that is a very important place culturally and spiritually and economically for Treaty 8 First Nations and is also home to um, many uh, species that are vulnerable to extinction. And Site C would flood the last remaining tract of the Peace River Valley. When the project was announced by former Premier Gordon Campbell in 2010, the price tag was $6.6 .6 billion. Now that price tag is at $10.7 billion. It really doesn't make sense in terms of the amount of energy that it's going to produce for the price that we are all going to have to pay for that energy if and when it, it comes online. And, and just to give you an idea of a, a, a comparative figure for the price of the energy, at $10.7 billion, and there's absolutely no guarantee that Site C is going to stay at that cost. Well, there's a guarantee that it won't. But. Yes, many people think that it has already risen beyond that cost. But at that cost, energy experts say that it will cost anywhere from about $120 to $140 per megawatt hour for the power. What Albert, is a megawatt? Is a, a megawatt is a, a measure of the amount of power. Is a million watts so Site C would produce 1,100 megawatts, a little less than one third of the combined power of the two pre-existing dams on the piece. So it's going to cost between 120 and 140 dollars per megawatt per hour. hour. Alberta just bought wind power at 37 dollars per megawatt hour, and in the states, people are buying solar power with storage for 36 dollars per megawatt hour, and wind power with storage for far less than that. So. Aside from so many other considerations, um, uh, the First Nations considerations, environmental considerations, agricultural considerations, human rights considerations, because Amnesty International says that Site C violates basic human rights on a number of fronts. Amnesty says that Site C does not meet international standards for forced evictions and that it also violates the treaty rights of First Nations. So aside from all of those considerations, the project makes no sense economically. We do not need the power. And if we were to need the power, if we were going to electrify the province, there's, there's a lot of talk about that, and all start driving electric vehicles, there are far cheaper and less destructive ways to get that power. But we don't need the power. Energy demand in BC has been flat since 2005. We have so much extra power in this province right now that we're paying independent power producers millions of dollars a year not to produce power. Even BC Hydro says that we're going to have a surplus of power in the province right into the 2030s. So we don't need the power. And so this project does not make sense on any level. It's been put forward for political reasons, not because it's in the public interest. And so the book traces the journey of the people who have been fighting this project, looks at the justification for it, spends, I spend a lot of time with energy experts and scientists and uh, people up in the piece. And I look at Site C from the perspective of the people who will be most affected by the project. You've covered a few of the things that you wanted to talk about. Um, you want to say something about the Rocky Mountain Fort Camp. Yes, yeah, so the Rocky Mountain Fort Camp, it was very, very briefly in, in the news in parts of the province. 
Um, that camp was set up um, a little over two years ago and uh, it was a few months after preliminary clearing work for Site C had begun and First Nations members and farmers set up a winter camp in January in temperatures as low as minus 24 degrees Celsius and they stayed at that camp for two months in an effort to uh, prevent clear-cut logging for Site C. Um, the camp was at the confluence of the Moberly River and the Peace River and it was um, on the site of the Rocky Mountain Fort, which is a, a designated heritage and archaeological site in this province. It was the first uh, fur trade fort in mainland BC and the site was selected by explorer Alexander Mackenzie. It was a meeting place for uh, fur traders and for uh, First Nations. And the reason that the camp was set up there was that it, in addition to having those historic values, the area had a number of other protective designations. It was had been set aside to become part of a BC protected area. It was a designated old growth um, management area. And it, it was a very uh, special cultural and spiritual place uh, for Treaty 8 First Nations. And part of the book um, looks, a chapter or two looks at that camp. I spent a couple of days there and I happened to be there when scientist David Suzuki and uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip from the Union of BC Indian Chiefs came to the camp for a day. And so I document life in the camp and talk about why um, First Nations members and farmers would go to the extreme of setting up a camp and basically camping in winter uh, for two months. And the book also looks at um, what happened uh, to them in terms of the camp. And what happened was that BC Hydro applied for an injunction application to remove the camp. And at the same time, BC Hydro also launched a civil lawsuit against some of the campers along with Jane and John Doe. And that civil lawsuit accused them of trespass, conspiracy, uh, in trying to um, engaging in um, obstruction of uh, e an economic project by unlawful means. The list just went on and on. And uh, some of the lawyers that I spoke to about this said that they had actually never heard of a government suing its own citizens. And Wait. yes, that, that this is, as far as they know, this is unprecedented that a government would sue its own citizens. And part of uh, the lawsuit was uh, suing these people and Jane and John Doe, which could be anybody who later um, physically protested Site C, um, was uh, suing them for damages. And the amount of damages that were suggested in court were in the order of $420 million. How what, many people are sharing this? <laughs> well, um, six people were named in the lawsuit. One of them had actually never been at the camp, but she'd allowed the helicopter uh, carrying the Grand Chief and uh, David <coughs> Suzuki to fly from her land, and she had allowed a helicopter carrying survival shacks to fly from her land. So six people were named, but again, because Jane and John Doe were named in the suit, that, that could be anybody in the future. So the suit left the door open for naming more people if more people chose to physically protest Site C. So the people set up the camp, did they actually block work from taking place? They didn't actually block work from taking place. What happened is that they, um, they established the camp and about a kilometer and a half through a, a forest in the path was where um, the logging had, had approached. And during the, the Christmas holidays that year, that was as 2015 drew to a close, um, the uh, BC Hydro contractors built a bridge across the mouth of the Moberly River and moved logging equipment over. Uh, they were able to do that because of uh, permits issued by the outgoing Stephen Harper government. Um, in a remarkable departure from convention, the permits were issued during the election campaign that uh, Stephen Harper subsequently lost. So they had moved the logging equipment over and they had started to clear cut some of these old growth trees. The campers set up a camp again about a kilometer and a half away, but they established a bonfire uh, down by the mouth of the Moberly River and uh, the, the First Nations members were um, uh, 
engaging in traditional practices, walking around, engaging in traditional practices. They were not actually blocking the machines, but there was there. an order that the machines couldn't continue right. logging so with people there. They weren't putting their bodies in front of the machines. So did BC Hydro sue or did the provincial government sue these people? Uh, BC Hydro BC did. Hydro. Now, is I've heard occasionally mention of a request to the new NDP government uh, to withdraw a lawsuit. I'm assuming maybe this is the one. This is the lawsuit. And there was also a second uh, civil lawsuit launched against uh, some, a group of young people, mostly young people who set up a camp in front of BC Hydro's uh, corporate headquarters in Vancouver. Uh, they maintained that camp. You might remember a young woman named Christian Henry, a Simon Fraser University graduate who went on a hunger strike uh, in an effort to stop sightseeing. Actually, I don't remember one word of any of that being told. You know, I, I read the daily paper here every day. I listen to the radio. I watch TV. They weren't talking about that too much, yeah. and I'm not surprised. They don't want us to hear about these kinds of things, but that's my opinion. It, it got very little media coverage. In fact, the whole issue of Site C and uh, the people in the piece who are fighting the project has received very little media coverage, um, which and is very unfortunate. that's the only reason it's been allowed to go ahead. If people knew from the very beginning, I heard an expert uh, during the Site C summit and, and, and also on the radio, M I can't remember, McCullough, maybe? Uh, Robert McCullough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he basically said that when this whole thing was beginning 10 years ago, or, you know, the, the third beginning, mm -hmm. he said BC Hydro basically faked the numbers to make it seem that uh, building Site C was cheaper than wind. But he said BC Hydro uses a different formula than every other public utility in, in North America. He said if you say, take the same numbers, and put those numbers into anybody else's formula, wind comes out as cheaper than building Site C. But with the BC Hydro numbers, Site C came out as cheaper than wind. So that's how it all began, and the media knew, the NDP knew, but we, we the public, were never told, and here we are 10 billion dollars later. And those BC Hydro numbers, I will point out, were when the dam, when the price tag for Site C was at 7.9 billion. And after that, it climbed to 8.8 .8 billion, and now it's at 10.7 billion. Uh, so those numbers simply do not hold up. Um, another reason to, uh, if we needed the energy again, to uh, look at things like wind and solar is because uh, First Nations communities all over the province want to engage in clean energy projects and Site C has prevented them from doing that in any meaningful way with a few small exceptions here and there. Uh, so the First Nations um, see Site C, uh, see uh, clean energy as a uh, both an economic driver for their communities and a step towards reconciliation. It has all kinds of spin-off benefits and going ahead with Site C means that we have stopped a lot of First Nations communities from pursuing clean energy projects. That is a very, one very unfortunate outcome of the decision to continue with this project. There's no time left but last question was what happens now? What happens now? Well, there are three different Treaty 8 First Nations in court this summer um, in two separate court cases uh, trying to, one of them is trying to stop Site C and the other uh, bought, launched by the Blueberry River First Nations, <coughs> a Treaty 8 First Nation um, alleges that the cumulative impact of development in their traditional territory, including Site C, means that members can no longer engage in practices guaranteed to them in the treaty. So both of those court cases are going to be heard in July. Both are um, super important for a number of reasons. Um, so that's basically what happens next. And groups like the Peace Valley Landowner Association, representing 70 uh, landowners who will be impacted by Site C, um, many of whom will lose uh, w property and in some cases their homes. Um, they, are al they also continue to fight the project. And we may also see uh, the first family actually forced from their home this summer. We're out of time. Uh, the government doesn't care what we want, but this is a project that has got to be stopped. Even if they build the damn thing, then it should never be filled. Uh, Sarah Cox, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Hello, my name is Kaylin Harris, and welcome to another segment of Citizens Forum. 
Joining me today is Stephen Hurdle. He's a researcher with Fairvo Canada and a bit of an expert in uh, electoral systems. So which is really handy given that we are hurdling towards, no pun intended, a, uh, a new electoral system and a referendum on that thing. And so we are here today to discuss um, what uh, is facing British Columbians in the, uh, the, up the upcoming referendum. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. So you and I were on another Shaw Cable uh, a production called Referendum 2018 uh, Voting for Change. And on that we discussed uh, before we knew any details what might be on the referendum in, in uh, November, October. And, uh, and so the, audit, uh, the Attorney General has uh, let us know, uh, the province know, what exactly we will be voting on. So I thought this would be a really great opportunity to kind of rehash some of the things that we uh, got right, got wrong, and then uh, some of the, the kind of the, the stuff that came up. Um, new uh, from his announcement. So um, let's just start with uh, discussing the, the questions itself, the, themselves. So we, we ended up with a two-parter, right? So can you fill us in on, on those, the, the, the two-part question? Yeah, that's, uh, that's exciting. That's not the way referendums have typically worked and uh, it's actually the fairest way to do it uh, and that's what's so exciting about it because traditionally uh, you, such as with the New Zealand referendum or the PEI referendum you, you end up in a situation where people who are against uh, change have no say in what if, if change happens what uh, change they get this by being a two-part question is incredibly fair because even if you are in favor of the status quo you nonetheless get a say in if there's change what change you get so that is a fantastic format for a question so um, I guess this is one of the fun questions that I had uh, coming from it was um, you don't have to vote yes in order to have a say so every British Columbian is going to an opportunity even if they vote no to be able to say uh, even if uh, even if we end up with this and I don't like it, uh, I would prefer this system, right? That, that's right, and that, that's fair because uh, if change is going to happen, you should have say in what that change is, whether you're in favor of change or not. So that is very democratic. That's very fair. It's not the way these referendums usually go, so that's really, really good. The other interesting thing is both parts of the question are optional. So you could say you could just say, yes, I like PR, or no, I don't like PR, and end at that. Uh, and not even answer the second question. Or you could actually ignore the first question. Maybe you're truly torn, but you nonetheless have an opinion on if change happens, what change it should be. So you, both parts of the question are optional, and uh, it, it's truly democratic and truly a fair approach. Cool. So let's back up for just a second, because we've kind of talked about the, the, the awesomeness of the question uh, without actually talking about the question. So uh, the first question is basically an up or down vote, whether or not uh, you are in favor of proportional representation or not, right? Uh, or you would like to stay with uh, our current first past the post yeah. system, or you would prefer uh, proportional representation. That, that's right? right. The first question is, do you like the status quo, or would you like a system that um, allocates seats proportionately to how the parties actually did in, in the uh, uh, in the popular vote? You know, we can all point to all sorts of elections that are, go wonky. The 1996 election, where uh, you know the the second place uh, party in the popular vote came first in the seats, you know, and, and goofy things like that. And uh, so the the proportional representation does away with all of that. The seats are always allocated fairly. Well, very cool. So uh, the second question then gets into the nitty gritty. So we've already kind of talked about the fact that uh, you get to choose uh, one of three systems, um, assuming that you are well to have your say on a proportional system if we end up with a proportional system. So the first, in no particular order, there is MMP, which is a mixed member proportional representation. Then you've got a rural urban um, a system, which is a made in BC approach, or made in Canada approach, I guess. Um, and then a DMP, which is a dual member proportional, which is something that uh, we didn't really expect um, in, uh, in, in in pro provincial politics or that we hadn't really seen a whole heck of a lot, but it does exist in, uh, in other parts of, of the world. Um, so the, I'd like to throw you a little bit of a compliment here in our other segment there that we did on uh, voting for change. We talked about two systems other than the um, uh, first past the post system that we've currently got. We talked about MMP and STV because you expected that those would be on the ballot and essentially we've got exactly that. We've got MMP, 
STV, which is a part of the rural urban uh, system. So if you could just elaborate on what makes rural urban a little bit different than STV, that'd be great. Okay. Um, uh, STV uh, and rural urban is interesting in that it's a hybrid system. It recognizes the unique uh, geography of BC uh, and uh, has one system for the urban areas, another for the rural areas. The intent there is to give urban voters more choice and to keep the ridings smaller for the rural areas. So uh, it's a, a Made in Canada proposal with a historical precedent because a similar system was used um, in the 1930s and 40s in Al for provincial elections in Alberta and Manitoba. Very cool. Okay, so uh, to break it down uh, regionally, I guess what you end up with is amalgamated ridings and urban centers and then um, kind of the similar scale of ridings in uh, urban ridings where they are already very, very large geographic regions, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that kind of breaks that down. So now we've got this, I think, very cool uh, alternative system that really hadn't been discussed a whole ton of. Um, to be fair to you, uh, you had also uh, constructed an idea that, or a, a, an alternative system that is very, very similar to this DMP system. Yeah. So um, you're obviously a good person to talk to about what this, what this is. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we talk about, um, yeah, just tell me how this is gonna work a little bit. It's, uh, maybe people will like to, to know how this works. Okay. Uh, DMP works on the idea, and DMP maybe, uh, you know, the simplest way to call it is dual member. Right. Uh, so dual member works uh, by two people by being elected in, in almost every riding. Uh, all the, the a very few very large rural ridings would remain single member to keep the, the size of those down, but every other riding would elect two MLAs and be doubled f uh, from their current size. So you would be amalgamated with a neighboring riding and you and your neighbor's votes would be pooled together to elect two uh, MLAs. And uh, the the, the system is designed to, uh, to allow pure proportionality across the province um, by how you select that second MLA. Okay, um, so I guess uh, maybe if we can um, you know, make a little bit of an ele elevator pitch. If, if people are, are looking to, to, to yeah. finish making dinner and they gotta shut us off here. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe just like a like what is what are the, the, the kind of the three key points of what they're what they're being offered, okay. um, and then um, yeah, and so maybe just a, a quick summary of like proportionality and, and, and value to the voter and okay uh, yeah, well, here's my elevator elevator pitch. If I had to describe all three systems and I had only a few moments before I lost someone's attention, which is typically the way. <laughs> uh, the um, dual member offers the most simplicity. Uh, and dual member um, has uh, additional benefits uh, as well, um, such as keeping the, ri the rural ridings the smallest. Um, rural urban uh, gives voters the most choice overall. So if you're really someone who's focused on uh, voters having a lot of choice, rural urban's probably the way you'd lean towards. Um, MMP, it's kind of halfway between the two. Um, I would additionally add that um, many voters are very passionate about independent candidates and independently minded members of uh, parties. They will probably want to go uh, for dual member because DMP does the best job of uh, empowering independent candidates uh, and uh, I think of the three systems. Oh, very cool. I think that's, uh, you're, you're right. I, my experience, of course, uh, talking to people is that um, quite often you have people that are really interested in making sure that they have a personal connection to their representative and that the representative isn't necessarily tied to any sort of partisan leaning. So um, now, I, now that I think we've got a lot of the complicated stuff out of the way, I think maybe this is a really great opportunity to kind of sit down and like, okay, I think a lot of the opponents of proportional representation are gonna talk about how complicated this is, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, like, what's this, what's this really actually break down to? Well, I, what I would say to that is, first past the post has become incredibly complicated because you have to second guess what all your neighbors are going to do. Be, uh, 
do you vote your conscience? That's one option. Uh, do you vote for whoever you think is most likely to win the riding? Uh, whether do you vote for whomever is most likely to win the overall election? Uh, do you vote for the party that is most likely to keep a party you really dislike out of power? So um, it's there's become this whole meta game surrounding first past the post that has made it the most complicated system on the planet. Um, it all comes down to I think ultimately comes down to your values. The people who I talk to who favor first past the post tend to do so because they believe that um, a strong majority government is ideal um, and, uh, and they're willing to accept a false majority to get it. What I would say to them is that actually the math and the experience doesn't back that up, that first past the post creates the weakest majority governments because a very small shift in the votes, maybe 3%, could switch from one majority party in power to another majority party in power in the next election. And that weakens those parties because they live in fear of doing anything. Because they, they, if they do something, they might shift that 3% some other way and, and lose in the next election. So whereas uh, much larger shifts are required under proportional representation to change the balance of power. So I would actually argue that a first past the post weakens majority governments. Um, those who support PR, proportional representation, tend to do so because they believe in the value that a party should get exactly the votes they earn, no more, no less. They don't believe a party should win 40% of the vote and get 100% of the power. Um, within that, um, each form of uh, proportional representation speaks to slightly different values. You know, people who support dual member might do so because they passionately believe in independent candidates and they really want a system that empowers independence. Someone who supports mixed member proportional might passionately believe in the fact that um, the uh, MMP can um, be used to do things like uh, maintain better gender equity um, if, if you wanted to. You know, it could, be, it could be structured that way. I mean, there's still some details we need, don't know yet about how it's going to be structured, so that's going to be interesting to see. Um, people who support uh, rural-urban might do so because uh, they strongly believe in keeping rural ridings smaller, uh, and, uh, for, and they might uh, the passionately believe in the value of more choice to the voter because uh, the other systems allow people to vote for just a single candidate, whereas um, the urban component of rural urban allows people to say, well, I like this candidate first, I like this candidate second, I like this candidate third. They uh, passionately believe in their vote not being wasted uh, and because um, there are two types of wasted votes, and we forget about that. The first type of wasted vote is one that elects no one, because the second type of wasted vote is one that isn't necessary because you voted for an overwhelmingly popular candidate. And the urban component of rural urban fixes both of those. It fixes the wasted vote by allowing uh, uh, for to uh, go to an, you know from an unpopular candidate to a more popular candidate. But it also, if your candidate doesn't need it, allows you to go to second choice. Well, thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, we're, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, these conversations with you always end up really quickly, or are going so quick. Um, thank you very much for joining us again on uh, another Citizens Forum. I'm Kalen Harris, and look forward to another segment talking about electoral reform in the, in the very near future. Thank you again.